Chapter 21 Chapter 21 Two weeks later The Ascendancy forces have successfully taken control of the entire planet. The leader of the Orenian government, the Magnus, has been taken into custody and will be publicly executed in front of all the Orenians. After taking the planet, Alexander had found out the exact number of people on the planet, which was 250 million. He was lucky that most people had decided not to join the fight, since if they did, he would still be trying to take control of the planet. But it was also thanks to Titus, who had successfully gathered a lot of support on the planet from the people who wanted a better life. Though some who were military fanatics didn't like the idea and had joined the government in fighting. The entire planet was split between those who wanted a better life and those who supported the old ways. But there were more people who wanted a better life for their children and themselves, so the number of people who supported the old ways was only around 20 million. 10 million of those 20 million were killed trying to fight against the Ascendancy, while the rest surrendered after all the high-ranking members of the government were captured. Now Alexander was on board a shuttle heading down to the planet's surface to address the Orenian people who decided to support him for a better life. His shuttle was being escorted by ten fighters as well as five gunships. After a couple of minutes, the shuttle had arrived in the city of Fort Maximus, the former capital city of the Orenian people. The shuttle landed at the former military capital building, which was used to oversee the entire Orenian people and was the headquarters of the government. Now, it would become the new building for the planet's administration that Alexander would create. As the shuttle doors opened, Alexander walked down the ramp with Urena and Yona following behind him, while in front of him was a mini platform where he will stand and deliver his speech to the Orenian people. Hundreds of sentinel droids were already protecting the platform, with snipers on every building within a five-mile radius. The protection of Alexander was the top priority of the droids at this time, since even if most of the people here are said to support their new leader, there might still be those who wish to do harm to Alexander. Once Alexander's face had been seen by the Orenian people, they were glad that he was a human, since they originally thought that he would also be a droid since his entire army was made up of droids. They didn't know that on board his ships were Rakata crew members and even Rakata soldiers, there were other Rakata regiments across the planet that occupied other cities on the planet and even Rakata pilots. But no Rakata was sent to Fort Maximus because of the amount of soldiers that were garrisoned there, numbering in the millions. And the Rakata already had a low number of population, making preventing a lot of Rakata casualties a high priority. Once Alexander stepped onto the platform, he had greeted the people who greeted him back with cheers and voicing their support for his rule. He was surprised that he was this loved by people that he just conquered. But once he thinks about, he too would be happy if he was promised a better life than being a slave and being forced to join the military to earn citizenship. One hour later, and Alexander had finished delivering his speech to the people, which was also displayed on holograms in the other cities around the planet. All he really talked about was the future of the planet of Orin and how the people would be ruled. One thing he made sure was that all Orinians will be citizens under the government and will be protected by the government. The new government of the planet will be completely run by the Emperor Alexander, and he also introduced a new system that looked to help the Orinian people and create a better and more stable society. He had introduced new jobs that would be created and a new currency called intergalactic coins, which the people would be paid with for the jobs they do. The currency could also be used, virtually, as he also created a type of bank card that the people could use to buy various things in the Ascendancy. He also planned to build a bank that would be built on all planets of the Ascendancy and be under government supervision. After making the speech, Alexander had returned to his ship where he was notified by TB that there was an increase in the number of ships and droids that the Starforge could produce. The 20 ship limit had been increased to 40, and the amount of droids had increased to 2 million. 
It seems that capturing planets has been very beneficial to Alexander, and he wanted to hurry and conquer his next target to increase his military power. And since there were lots of unknown planets in the unknown regions, he had a lot of options to consider. Chapter 22 Chapter 22 After taking Oreen Alexander had returned to Lahan while leaving ten ships to defend and patrol the Oreen system. He had made Titus into the temporary governor of the planet and gave him a list of things that he needs to do as governor. Of course there was always droids watching his every move, since even though he swore his loyalty when given a position of power, he might have different plans. His next target, which was the C. Ruvi Imperium, was a powerful race that he would have to fight. And as of right now, he doesn't have the ships nor the soldiers to fight them, but that was only an estimate, since he doesn't exactly know how many ships or troops that they have. But from what he saw on the data tablet, they were a very powerful empire that occupied multiple planets and had lots of ships numbering in the hundreds, which was way more than he had. And since they had ships numbering in the hundreds, then their ground troops must number tens of millions. So attacking them now was not going to happen. So he planned to return to Lahan and continue training and mastering the force and learning new abilities, while he will put a droid admiral in charge of leading a fleet to conquer smaller worlds and find new resources in the surrounding systems. Once he returned to Lahan, he contacted Cortana and had her create a more intelligent droid that would be suitable to be an admiral and operate on its own and make its own decisions to difficult situations. He wasn't saying that the current droid admirals were not intelligent, it's just that they are not suitable for what he has planned. He needs them to be able to conquer multiple worlds while limiting casualties of droids and mine lots of resources to send back to Lahan to be processed and used for building ships, building droids, building new structures on the planet, and a barrage of other things. And for that, he needs a capable droid admiral for that. The process for creating a droid such as that didn't take Cortana long, as her knowledge and intelligence increases every day, so creating a droid such as that was a simple task for her. She finished it within an hour and was about to tell Alexander, but saw that he was busy with Urena and Yona, so she waited until the next day to tell him. The next morning, Alexander was laying on his bed looking at the information in the datapad about the Cyruvi Imperium so that he can better understand them. He also looked at an organization called the Sorcerers of Rand, which were a group of beings who believed in a power greater than the Force, which they called the Dark. By following the will or the way of the Dark, they were granted special powers, aka the Force. There were two things he thought about the Sorcerers of Rand, those being that they could either be an asset to him and his empire, or they could be threat. But if he learns this new force ability that he is struggling to learn, then they will be an asset that he can control. While he was deep in his thoughts, a holographic image of Cortana showed up as she was laying on his stomach. Alexander was still thinking about the sorcerers of Rand that he didn't notice until she called his name. Alexander, said Cortana in a low voice which spooked him. He had almost jumped hearing the voice, but he remembered that Urena and Yona were next to him, so he didn't move since he didn't want to wake them. Jesus Christ, Cortana, you scared me for a second there, said Alexander. Cortana smiled, seeing as she successfully scared him. You looked like you were thinking about something, so I wanted to scare you to see how you would react. Normally I wouldn't be scared, but since I was thinking about something, you caught me off guard, but forgetting about that. Have you completed it? Yep, said Cortana, as she pulled up the design and of the droid on the data tablet and some information on its capabilities. This droid is more advanced than any droid we currently have at the moment and will be able to carry out whatever you ask of it and be able to make difficult decisions that will benefit the Ascendancy. He also has all the combat information of various ship formations and such that will greatly help him in battles, and his name is ET-8243, or just Ethan for short, explained Cortana. Alexander was looking at the data tablet and was glad that he has Cortana, since he couldn't fathom having to create something like this by himself 
or having to steal it from some secret location. Also concerning the production of clones, I have successfully completed and tested multiple different variations of the genetic makeup with the research droids, and after almost 20 fails, I have come up with a 100% complete genetic makeup that will make the clones better than those produced in the galaxy. But I also had to leave a few genetic makeups out because of the stress and different reactions that the body would have. So instead, I made two more genetic makeups that we could use for elite soldiers such as personal guards and the other for infiltration extraction teams. The standard generic makeup that will be used for regular clone soldiers will enhance their strength, speed, agility, learning rate, and various other combat abilities. As for the elite soldiers, they will have the same thing as the regular clones, only their stats will be significantly greater. For the infiltration extraction teams, they will have abilities that help them carry out sabotage missions, spy on people located in different empires, extract people from other empires without drawing too much attention, and commence strikes on any planet located in the galaxy. Explained Cortana. Alexander smiled hearing that since now he will have clones. How long would the clones take, and also what about that other project I asked you to make? The regular clones will take nine months to become 18 years of age, while the elite clones they will take a full year for both types to become full adults, and as for that project I need more time to design it and to gather more information before I come up with a complete model, said Cortana. TC well it is a hard task to do, but I know you can do it, said Alexander Cortana smiled as she stood up. Thanks, Master. Your words are too kind. Master, didn't you just call me Alexander earlier? That was to surprise you, but if you prefer me call you that, then I will, said Cortana. Alexander thought about it for a while before he made his decision. Yeah, call me by my name for now on. Of course, Alexander, so if you will excuse me, I will start the production of clones immediately and continue with my research of new technologies, said Cortana as she disappeared. Seeing her disappear, Alexander continued looking at the tablet, but this time he looked at the new ship designs that he planned to start construction of soon once he gets the resources that he needs. Chapter 23, Chapter 23 A year later, after the conquest of Oreen, Alexander has been training and mastering all force abilities that he knew about from TB. He even mastered some of the more darker abilities that he would only use on his most hated enemies or when he sees that the time is right. The first batch of regular clones and elite clones has been produced, which numbered a total of 400k, which was currently the maximus that he can produce and maintain. He had the capacity to produce 900k, but he was told by Cortana that the current food that is being produced is not enough to maintain all the 900k clones, so he could only produce 400k. Clone Armor Keep in mind that this is only the Mark I version of the armor, meaning that as time goes by, new upgraded armor that will probably look different will be introduced. Cortana had also came up with the idea to start creating artificial farms, which Alexander thought was a good idea. But they didn't start building the farms until late in the year because of all the shipbuilding construction that was going on. Throughout this year, Alexander also discovered the Rakatan Archipelago, which was a region in the Unknown Regions that consisted of several scattered, isolated Rakata colonies. All of the planets were inhabited by the descendants of the Rakata, who had fled Lehon just before the fall of the Infinite Empire in 25,200 BBY. But unlike Lehon, these Rakata have discovered spaceflight and have begun fighting amongst themselves over resources in hopes of once again achieving their once lost glory. Before these Rakata fled the planet, they took slaves with them, which have survived throughout these thousands of years and are still enslaved by the Rakata to this day. Many of the slaves consisted of Togruta, Twi'lex, and humans. The rest of the slaves of other ancient descendants died. The droid Admiral Ethan had first tried to negotiate with the Rakata tribes of Makatak and Tulpa about surrendering, but they didn't like that idea and decided to fight back. But with their insignificant ships, they didn't last long, and soon their planet was invaded. After taking Makatak and Tulpa, Ethan had requested transport ships for the millions of Rakata that were on the planet, 
Alexander had already gotten the report from Ethan and was glad that he didn't have to contact him and what to do. So he had the construction droids build two massive ships that could carry up to five million each and had them sent to the two worlds to transport the Rakata to their homeworld. Makatak and Tolpa would be turned into mining worlds once the Rakata are gone. Ethan, after finishing setting up a mining operation in the Makatak and Tolpa systems, had proceeded to the next system, which was the Fetomp system that contained the next planet called Fetomp that also had Rakata on it. But unlike the other two planets, these Rakata had reverted to a tribal stage and had no type of advanced technology. This made taking the planet easier and much faster. Ethan had only left a 100,000 droid on the planet while he left to take the other planets. Within a month, Ethan had fully taken the planets Hillac, Persapa, Malata, and Grustrik, which all contained scattered tribes of the Rakata species and even a few slaves that were still left. It took a full week to get all the population of these planets back to Lahan, the Rakatan homeworld, which has been completely transformed not physically, but by how much activity is on the planet. The population of Lahan had grown from 4.5 million to 144 million. Each of the seven planets had 20 million population each, which a low population being slaves. So now the population of Lahan was split into four different species, which were Rakata, Human, Tegruda, and Twi'leks. Of the 144 million population, 5 million were Human, 3 million were Togruta, 1 million were Twi'leks, and the rest were Rakata. Now over thousands of years, their numbers could have been more than this, since unlike on Lahan, where the population had to live underground, the other planets high, at Rakata, roaming the surfaces and establishing tribes and colonies, cities and such. But with various tribes comes many wars, which made the population start to drop, and also some Rakata still had the virus in them that has been passed down for generations, preventing some Rakata from reproducing, or some even died at birth. This was a lingering problem for the Rakata in the Rakatan archipelago for thousands of years. But luckily, now it could be fixed by Alexander once he visits Coruscant to get the necessary ingredients to use for both the cure to the disease and to make a cure so that the Rakata can use the Force once again. But back to Lahan, on the surface of the planet, hundreds of thousands of droids could be seen working, building cities for the new population of people that have just arrived. Thousands of artificial farms were also created to accommodate for the increase in population and for the future increase in population. The Rakata once brought to the planet were scared and some thought they were going to be killed, but when they arrived, they were greeted by their own species, which surprised them. The current Rakata residents of Lehan started telling them about why they are here and what's going on. So the Rakata that were already on the planet informed them of what happened to them and what will happen to them in the future, also about the promise of restoring their former glory, just without the slavery part. All the slaves were happy, since they wouldn't be slaves anymore. All the people brought to Lahan had gone through a type of orientation that told them about the Terran ascendancy and the rules and laws that must be upheld and followed by all citizens. Various job opportunities were introduced to them, and a new life was beginning for them. As for the former slaves, Alexander had all of them tested for their midi-chlorian count to see if he had any potential force users that he could have Urena and Yona start training. It took a couple of days for both the orientation and the testing, as the testing was done first. Out of the nine million freed slaves, only 200 of them possessed the ability to use the force. The average amount amongst those 200 were a 10,000 midi-chlorian count, with the highest being 12,000. Alexander hoped to get somebody stronger, but he wasn't complaining as he now has 200 future Force users under his empire. Within these 200, 150 were humans with 10 being Twi'leks and the rest were Togrutas. Majority of the users were male, while only 30 were females. Alexander had pulled these 200 people into his palace as he wanted to personally speak with them. Chapter 24 Chapter 24 Alexander had all the 200 future Force users that he will start having trained brought into a room in the palace. 
after everybody had came in and sat down, he started to explain to them what was going to happen to them. First, all of them will be trained in the ways of the Force and be a part of the First Order of the Guardians, which will be a Force organization directly under Alexander. They will be trained in all forms of the Force, both the good and the evil, so that they can learn to balance between the two. Any person who fails to learn balance and be consumed by the dark side will be kicked out of the order and thrown into a prison to be confined for the rest of their lives. This had made some of them scared and more determined to learn balance because nobody wanted to be put into a prison for the rest of their lives. And they were even more determined since Alexander had freed them from being slaves. The reason that had a big impact on them is because they have been slaves for thousands of years. Their ancestors had tried to break free from being slaves, but failed now because of that. They have been treated even worse after the slave rebellion. That was the only rebellion that happened, since nobody wanted to rebel again and lose their lives in a war that they probably won't win. So for thousands of years, they have always been hoping that a day would come, and when they were free and now that day is here, and they are even given the chance to become a powerful force users, something that they haven't seen for thousands of years and only thought was a legend from the past. They would not waste this opportunity as they all got down and groveled on the floor as they did as slaves and swore their loyalty. They didn't know to bow or anything since as slaves they are lower than anybody and often groveled before their masters like so. Alexander was surprised by this and had motioned them to get up, since from now on they wouldn't have to grovel before anyone. Irina, who was standing beside Alexander, had spoke. Yes, you won't need to grovel, but instead you will learn how to bow, so let me show you, said Irina, as she stood right in front of them and bowed her head with her body leaning forward slightly. The former slaves had copied her, eager to learn how to bow, since they didn't know. Alexander shook his head, seeing what was happening in front of him. After teaching them how to bow, Irina had taken them to the already constructed Guardian Temple, which was located near the palace. The temple was massive. In fact, it was bigger than the Jedi Order Temple on Coruscant and had a statue of a Force user balancing two colored balls in his hands. In the left hand was a blue ball representing the good and the right represented the bad. This statue was to represent one of the main codes of the Guardians, which was balance. For now, that was the only statue until Alexander builds more of them that will represent some other things. Inside the temple, there were many rooms where the future knights and masters of the Order will reside alongside the apprentices. Once they walked in, Irina had taken all of them to the bath, which was located inside the temple. She split them up between the males and females and had them take a bath so that they can put on fresh clothes. Once they are done taking a bath, they will be taken to their rooms, which will have four people of the same gender in a room so that those four can form a close bond with each other. Now, of course, all the force users that will be trained will form a close bond and there will be no hostility towards each other. Alexander doesn't want people to be going after each other with their newly learned abilities. While the situation with the 200 Force users were taken care of, Alexander had started to look at the reports of the millions of Rakata that were now on the planet. He planned to split some of them up into three to four groups to have them live in cities around the planet. While this was going on, somewhere in an unknown place, two people were training. One of them was a normal girl around the age of 18 while the other was a woman who looked to be around the age of her early twenties, and she was also a higher existence as she was a goddess. The goddess had knocked the lightsaber out of the other girl's hand, forcing her to throw her hands up and surrender. Okay, you won, said the girl as she looked a little upset that she lost again. Yes, for the 322nd time I have won while you are still not ready, said the goddess. Come on, I want to see my sisters and my master said the girl pouting. You will, but first you need to learn a few more things so that you can help your master, then you will send to greet him with a present from me. All right, said the goddess. Okay, I will work even hard then, said the girl, as she had a face full of determination, 
Chapter 25 Chapter 25 On Coruscant, at the Jedi Order Temple, Anakin Skywalker, who was the age of 13, has been training to become a Jedi for four years now. But it wasn't a peaceful four years, since at the start of his Jedi training he has been having constant visions of the Republic fighting the against the Empire. He even told the Masters of the Council about this, but they only dismissed it, since they already knew how big a threat the Empire was to the Republic. And now at the age of 13, Anakin is having visions of strange armored soldiers of various races not known to the galaxy fighting against the other white armored soldiers. But most of all, he saw a strange green humanoid race that was destroying all the enemies in their way. This caused Anakin to feel fear, just seeing those soldiers causing him to wake up out of his sleep. Master Yoda, who was meditating, had sensed young Anakin's fear, so he called him to his room to see what it was about. Young Anakin had told him about his vision and what he saw in it. To another master it might sound like a dream, but to Master Yoda he could tell that it was more to it than that. So, he went to the temple's archives that contained ancient knowledge of the galaxy from thousands of years ago. As he walked through the archives, he felt the force guiding him to a certain section, so he followed its guidance. Moments later, he was led to a book that had the title, Rakatan Demise, so he grabbed the book and started to read through it. For several hours, he read through the book, but what he read shocked him, since the race that he read about from the book sounded exactly like the race that young Anakin described. The Rakata, who created the Rakata Infinite Empire that enslaved half the galaxy thousands of years ago. Now, while Anakin's visions could just be dreams or something else, it wouldn't hurt to investigate this matter, since if the Rakata really were back, who knows if they would try to enslave the entire galaxy once again. But first, Master Yoda needed to rest, so he waited until the next day to meet with the other masters of the Jedi Order, back in the unknown region's palace. Three months have passed. Alexander has been reading over the reports sent in from Ethan about the various mining places that he has found. He also encountered various tribal worlds with humans on them that he conquered and had sent back to Lahan. Ethan had received lots of ships from Alexander, which he would use to defend from the dangers of the unknown regions. Alexander had created many mining fleets, which would go to the various systems which has been marked to have resources. Escorting the mining ships would be 20 Architans-class light cruisers that would provide security to the mining droids. While the resources from these mining fleets greatly expanded Alexander's building capabilities, for now he was focusing on bringing in resources so that he can start building stations in the surrounding systems in order to claim them for himself. Once he builds a station that will monitor all activity in the system, he can build a mining station which will be more efficient than the mining fleet and be able to mine more resources and transport them back to Lahan. Over these three months, the races on Lahan, including the Rakata, have all adapted to their new home and sharing each other's unique cultures with each other. And while there were still some small conflicts, the four races got along together. Even the Rakata were getting along and working together with their former slaves. Many tried to rebel and influence people that working together with slaves is an insult to their species, and many of the new Rakata joined them and tried to cause problems for the capital city, but they were put down by other Rakata and human security forces. Because of this, nobody ever thought to speak out again and only decided that changing their ways would be for the best. Also, the Star Forge capacity increased since it has been a year already. The number of ships he could produce has been expanded to 80 and the number of droids to 4 million. With this increased, Alexander didn't waste any time and starting producing droids to speed up the various projects that he has going on, since he will be leaving in a week to go to Coruscant and get the ingredients to make an antidote for the Rakata disease that won't allow them to wield the Force. Coming with him was obviously Yurina and Yona, and 10 HK assassin droids that would protect him while he was on the planet. Cortana would also be with him, since she would be connected to a device developed her herself that would allow her to communicate with him and see what he sees. 
She would also be able to talk to him, of course, and if by any chance she loses connection with him, she can also see through the HK assassin droids. And if she still can't see him, she will have one million droids on standby that will be a ten-minute jump away from the system that will start attacking the planet along with a fleet. Now, while smaller in numbers, Alexander's fleet has expanded to a total of ten superstar destroyers that will attack the planet and rescue Alexander at all costs. Alexander would also use this chance to start up a mercenary company, Corporation. He would sell high-valued ships at an affordable price that will baffle the galactic community and build up his wealth. Cortana had come up with a perfect plan for the corporation, since building high-tech ships would attract lots of customers, even the unwanted ones, like the Empire. But it was all part of her plan, since she knew that the Empire would be their future enemies, so getting in contact with them early would be more beneficial so that Cortana can come up with a countermeasure for them. DA Chapter 26 Chapter 26 A week had passed, and now it was time for Alexander to go to Coruscant. His absence won't affect anything, since if anything happens while he is gone, he will be notified immediately and be able to issue orders on what to do while he is gone. The Force users will continue their training using a training droid who has been filled with the knowledge of the Force and Way of the Jedi and the Sith by Cortana. Before he left, Alexander had stopped by the cloning labs and seen the clones that were already looking six to eight years old being trained in the courtyard of the facility. Each clone was given a birth number, but that number wouldn't be their name. Instead, they were given actual names instead of something like C-7342. Once the clones had seen Alexander, they had all stopped what they were doing and ran up to him. The reason they did this was because Alexander frequently visits the cloning facilities to check up on the progress of the children and sometimes even talk with them or watch them train. Children knew that Alexander was the emperor, so the first time they saw him, they were told to pay their respects, but Alexander dismissed that and told them that they can relax around him since they were still children. Still, some of them still paid their respects and saluted him, showing their discipline from training. As the children ran up, they were all excited to see him again. Your Majesty, are you here to watch us train again, or are you going to train with us? Asked the kids. Unfortunately, not today, since I will be leaving today, so I came to see your progress one more time before I leave, said Alexander. One of the kids had pulled up his sleeve and showed his small muscle. Look, your majesty, my muscle is getting bigger by the day. Seeing this, the other kids did the same, trying to show off their strength that they had at such a young age. Alexander couldn't help but laugh, since no matter the galaxy, boys will be boys. After that, Alexander spent a few minutes training with the kids before he had them return to their drill instructor while he went to his ship. Already waiting on the ship were Irina and Yona, and a group of HK assassin droids that will protect him while he is on Coruscant. They were made out of the strongest lightweight metal that Cortana could find and had an upgraded AI core that would make their movements faster, and they were equipped with a cloaking device that will make them completely invisible to the naked eye. They also had other things that would allow them not to get detected by any security cameras or thermal devices on Coruscant. The ship that they would be using was a Droven freighter, which has been improved with an advanced ship core, improved engines, improved shields, and improved weapons. Drovan freighter image. It also had a small hangar that was built onto the ship by Alexander. This small hangar contained four fighters that would protect the ship if anything were to happen. In the cargo hold were crates full of droids that would deploy if anything bad were to happen. One crate could hold 20 droids, and Alexander had a lot of them, just in case something happens. And if they are for some reason stopped by a contraband search, Alexander can hide the crates in a sealed-off part of the cargo hold, leaving just the crates full of resources that he will use, since an empty freighter would seem kind of suspicious. Leaving that matter aside, Alexander walked to the bridge and sat down in his chair, which was placed in the middle of the room, while Urena and Yona sat down in the chairs next to him. The droid pilot turned around and asked for permission to take off. 
Alexander nodded, and within a few minutes, they left the atmosphere of the planet and jumped into hyperspace. Chapter 27 Chapter 27 The journey to Coruscant was a smooth experience for Alexander, who has already gotten used to traveling in hyperspace and on spaceships. It took a couple of hours for them to reach Coruscant because of its distance from the Rakata home system. Once the ship came out of hyperspace, Alexander had seen possibly thousands of ships flying to and from the planet. As the ship was flying through space passing all the ships, Alexander was looking outside the ship's window since never before had he seen this many ships before. And each ship was flowing through traffic in an organized manner, making the flight to the planet much easier. After a few minutes, Alexander's ship had breached the atmosphere and was now heading towards the eastern spaceport on Coruscant, which was where visitors mainly go when visiting Coruscant. And that was where they were headed, to the eastern spaceport. As they flew towards the location of the eastern spaceport outside the ship, there was even more traffic on the planet, as Alexander saw probably more than 10,000 ships flying around the planet in an organized manner. These ships were flying in the sky lane, which was a level of repulsor lift traffic that allowed airspeeders to move about cities without causing crashes and such. Alexander's ship needed to take the sky lane to get to the eastern spaceport, so when it was safe, the droid pilot had slipped into the sky lane, not causing any traffic crashes or jams, and proceeded on through the sky lane just like all the other ships. Looking at the way that the sky lane is utilized, Alexander figured that he could use this once his planet starts developing more into a more modern planet where traders and such would come and visit him and the people living on the planet would be able to take air taxis and such. While he was thinking about using the sky lane idea for his planet, they had arrived at the eastern spaceport and had to a permission to land from the Coruscant Security Division located in the spaceport. Luckily, it didn't take long, and after a few minutes, they were directed to an empty port where they landed. Outside his ship, the Coruscant security team were awaiting Alexander to open the doors of the ships to initiate their inspection of the ship for contraband or anything suspicious. Alexander had already prepared for something like this and had the crates with the droids in them hidden in a secret location on the ship while he left out the food that he had brought so that it wouldn't seem suspicious that he had an empty cargo ship. After a few minutes, Alexander had opened the doors of the ship and was greeted by an officer of the security. The officer had seen Alexander walk off the ship with two beauties behind him, but he didn't say anything and instead carried on with his job, but he still couldn't help but look. Welcome to Coruscant, sir. We are the inspection team, which under Coruscant law have to inspect your ship for any contraband or anything that is unregistered for selling. Said the officer, No problem, but this is my first time on Coruscant, so what would be illegal and what would be legal to bring, said Alexander, as he was trying to act like a visitor and not raise any suspicion. Well, naming all of them would take hours, so I will just show you a list of the top illegal items that we look for, said the officer as he showed Alexander a list of all the illegal contraband that they looked for. Alexander looked through the list for a few minutes before he stopped since he had seen enough. And as you have seen, Weapons on their well, they are not illegal to sell or anything. You just need to have the things you're selling registered already and have the buyer's name with you. And once we confirm that your weapons are legal, then you can proceed to the Merchants Guild to sell them to the buyer, said the officer. TC Thought Alexander, since the Merchants Guild might be a good place to start if he were to start up a business in selling ships and possible weapons. So let's say if I want to start up my own business, where would I need to go for that? Or is that also what the Merchant Guild does? Asked Alexander. Yep, you should talk with one of the receptionist droids that will have all the information you're looking for and help you to start up your business. But first you would need to get a trading license and then have something that you can actually sell. Said the officer as he explained the process. Alexander nodded as he listened to the officer explaining the process. Then he looked over at Yona. 
Yona put that on our things to do before we leave, so that we can get that out of the way, said Alexander. Also, where would I find these medical ingredients? Said Alexander, showing the officer the items that he originally came here for. Well, I don't know, since these are not common medical ingredients, so all I can say is for you to talk with the Merchants Guild, since they will have more information regarding these items, since they often receive a lot of cargo with different things in them, so they might have a trader selling them, said the officer. Alexander nodded and thanked the officer for the information. After that, the inspection team had come back and reported that the ship was all good, so they left to go to their next job. Meanwhile, Alexander returned to his ship and had the droids who were hiding to come out. Okay, I want two of you to stay cloaked and position yourselves on rooftops, but remain hidden, and if you are spotted by anyone, be sure to eliminate them as quietly as possible, we don't want to attract too much attention. Said Alexander the droids saluted as they activated their cloak and ran off of the ship. As for the rest of you, I want two to come with me unarmed, while the rest remain on the ship and don't let anybody under any circumstances come aboard. With that, Alexander left the ship with Urena and Yona behind him and two droids. He proceeded towards the merchant's guild where he needed to go to learn about the medical ingredients that he needed. Meanwhile, at the Jedi Temple, Master Windu and most of the Jedi High Council had for a split second felt something strange with the Force, since they felt that for a second a powerful presence had popped up on Coruscant, but then it disappeared. The presence didn't feel good nor evil, so the Masters weren't worried and didn't try to investigate it. They returned to their daily activities of meditating and training the younglings. Chapter 28 Chapter 28 Welcome to the Merchant's Guild on Coruscant. My name is CT418, and I will be the one helping you today. So before we begin, can I get your registered ID with the Merchant's Guild, or if you are new, I can register you for one right here, said CT. Tam knew, so I will need to register for one, and I would also like to register for the creation of a shipbuilding company, said Alexander, since he was planning to first start a company that will, over the years, transform into a massive corporation. Well, First, I need to see a schematic of the ships that you plan to build, so that we can determine whether your business will be lucrative for the Merchant's Guild to invest in. And if it is, then you can receive a small starting investment from the Merchant's Guild that will help you start your business. But you will need to buy or build your own shipyard, said CT. Hearing what the droid said, starting a business would be harder than he thought unless he can find a way to get a lot of credits that he can use to build his own shipyard. Of course, he can build his own with his droids, but how will he justify the money used for building the shipyard? Thinking about that, Alexander thought that instead it would be easier to just create his own corporation without the supervision of the Merchant's Guild and start trading with various planets in the galaxy and expand his influence. And instead of focusing on just ships, he can expand to other areas such creating things that can improve people's daily lives. He can even make a space hospital that can cure any disease in the galaxy. With Cortana, his options were many, and he didn't need to join some merchant's guild to do that, so instead he will do it his own way, which is much easier anyway. To see, well, I don't have the schematics with me right now, so I guess I will put off that until later for now though. I need help finding some medical ingredients, and was hoping the Merchant's Guild might have knowledge of them," said Alexander, as he showed C.T. the list of medical ingredients that he needed. C.T. searched for the ingredients in the Merchant's Guild database and found a place where he can get them all within 30 seconds. After searching throughout the various guild members, I have found four possible people who are here on Coruscant with the ingredients that you need but first a meeting time and place will have to be set first, and the guild member must approve," said CT. How long does this generally takes? Asked Alexander. Well, the ingredients you asked for are currently in low supply and hard to come by, so not many are selling it for a low price or even selling it at all, and since you are not a licensed member of the guild, some members won't even agree to meet with you to discuss a mutual exchange, so the time all depends on the guild member, explained CT. 
TC then I guess I will find another way, but thanks for the help anyway. CT, said Alexander. No problem, the Merchant's Guild is always here to help. Alexander turned around and walked away with Yurina and Yona behind him. Instead of their normal clothes, they were wearing robes which covered their bodies, hiding their lightsabers and armor underneath. While they were walking away, Alexander looked at his wrists as Cortana appeared. Did you get the information, Cortana? Yes, I got the names and location of all four of the people that the droid found. Now all we need to do is pay them a friendly visit, and we can get the supplies, said Cortana, with an emphasis on friendly. Yes, have the assassin droids keep tabs on all four of these traitors, and make sure to inform me if something important happens. But for now, I will explore the city a little, since it is my first time seeing an entire planet that is one giant city, said Alexander. Also, Master, if you need money to start a company, I could just hack into the Merchant Guild and transfer over any amount that you need to your account, and nobody will ever find out, said Cortana. Hearing that, Alexander had the most perfect plan that he was going to use, Co. Ertana for, and for starting his corporation. It involved what Cortana just said about hacking into the Merchant's Guild and transferring money to his account. After she does that, Alexander can send some clones to pose as traders and begin trading with other traders, eventually growing big enough to where he will have influence in the galaxy and his corporation will be known. Chapter 29 Chapter 29 Alexander was walking through what some people would call streets of Coruscant, only there were not any cars on this street since everybody used speeders that flew above the city. Instead, it was more like a sidewalk where people walked to various locations to either shop or go to work. He wasn't looking for a particular place, instead he was just walking while observing his surroundings and exploring the city. Well, not exactly exploring, since Cortana had a full map of the entire planet, so he was just walking past interesting places with Urena and Yona walking behind him. He did occasionally visit some of the shops to see what they were selling, and if it interested him. But so far he found nothing interesting, so he just continued walking for about an hour. Eventually, he came across a cantina or bar that he walked inside so that he could sit down and relax. Cortana had already hacked into the merchant's guild and transferred some money over to an account that she created for him. This account was protected by the most advanced security in the galaxy, so nobody could get into it nor see how much money was inside of it. Of course, Alexander himself could see in it, and he was surprised by how many zeros he saw in his account, but he wasn't worried about it, and instead he just sat down with Urena and Yona. He would order a drink or something, but he didn't have a credit chip to pay for the drink, as Cortana had created one, but it was all the way back at his capital planet, and he didn't want to go all they back there just to get the credit chip, so he would wait until he returns. And unlike a normal credit chip, Cortana tweaked his credit chip so that it has a high security and so that it looked better than the normal ones. While Alexander was hearing about the credit chips from Cortana, he thought to implement something similar to that in his empire so that currency can flow easily and the economy can start booming. But unlike a normal credit chip that has a limit on how much is on it, he will make it like Earth where people would be able to spend as much money as they earned. While he was thinking about this at the Merchant's Guild main building, the top and richest people were having an emergency meeting about the current situation that just happened in the Merchant's Guild. A ton of money was just taken out of their bank, and the amount was just too much for them to even believe it. So does anybody have any clue who could have done this, because my people can't seem to find even a trace of the transaction. Only that money was transferred somewhere, but they don't know where. Said Paul Vikrath, he was a Nymoidian, who was secretly a part of the Trade Federation. My people can't find anything either. It seems we have the same results. Said Gruce Ikoi, another one of the top richest people in the Merchants Guild. All the other merchants agreed with them, since they couldn't find anything either. So somebody just hacked into our merchant's guild, which has high security, and took most of our money with them, leaving us with only 15 cent, said Pav as he slammed his fist on the table. If people find out about this, 
we would lose a lot of customers, and we could possibly be sued for fraud by people if they find out, said Pav as he was panicking. Well, we need to close the merchant's bank, first and foremost. That should give us a 48-hour time limit to find the person who did this, or at least try them, said Gruss. And if we don't, said another merchant, then we will be brought up on charges and will be brought before the Senate and given a trial, said Gruss. Just as he said this, everybody had an angry look, since this could possibly be the end of them if they don't find this person. And just as they were beginning to lose hope, a person had burst through the doors, causing the merchants to look at this person in disgust for interrupting them. Sorry for bothering your meeting, but we may have found a potential target that could have been the culprit, said the person as they bro, tee the device to the table and turned it. It showed a blurred image of three figures talking with a protocol droid at one of the merchant's guild buildings at one of the ports. As you can see, I don't know why the camera is extremely blurred out at this moment, and it wasn't like that until these three came into view. So I just assumed that if they could do something like this without alerting our security team, then it must be these three, but we can't even make out their appearance, so finding them could be hard. And that was the only camera that spotted them in this entire area, said the person as they paused to catch their breath. It could be something wrong with the recorder, but it is suspicious since it only becomes like that when they come into view. So let's find out more about them. But for now, let's scramble our security teams in secret to look for this person and make sure they aren't spotted by Coruscant security, said Pav. The person nodded and left, leaving the merchants to further discuss what they can do to solve this problem. Chapter 30 Chapter 30 Master, we are almost there. The target building is only a couple of minutes this way, said Irina. Currently they were heading towards the building where the merchant that was selling the medical ingredients was located. The HK assassin droids had tracked the merchant and his merchandise to this location, and they were now surrounding the building, watching the merchant and making sure he didn't leave. With the merchant was a group of hired mercenaries to protect him and guard his merchandise that he was planning to sell. Master, it seems that the merchant is meeting with some other people in secret, who I have found out to be people from the Trade Federation, and from their conversation, they appear to be looking to buy the medical ingredient that we came for, said Cortana. The Trade Federation, huh? Alexander was a little surprised to see that the Trade Federation was looking to get the exact thing that he came here for. He was also curious as to what they would use it for, or if they were only going to just buy and sell it somewhere else for a higher price. Have the droids take out any guards in and around the building and to secure everybody inside the building, but make sure not to harm the merchant. As for the Trade Federation officials, I don't really care about them, said Alexander, since he had no need for them right now. After a few minutes, they arrived in front of the building and they were greeted by two HK assassin droids. Sir, we have secured the entire building and have detained all the mercenaries and the merchant, and we have droids stationed all over the area to watch for any reinforcements, and we have left the Trade Federation person alive since they surrendered without a fight. Reported the droid, very good, now take me to the merchant, said Alexander as he followed the droid into the building. After a minute, they had arrived in the room that the merchant was in, who was sweating his balls off right now, since all of a sudden these droids had come in and killed his guards and aimed their weapons at him, making him stay put. He was confused about what was happening, but he knew that these droids were under somebody else's control, and that person would arrive soon, but he still felt scared because the droids looked quite threatening. Then a few minutes later, three people walked in, escorted by two droids, one of the droids had grabbed a chair and placed it down a few feet away from the merchant. Then one of the three people had sat down in the chair while the other two stood on the side. So, Mr. Vostovor, I hear you are selling a very particular medical ingredient that I need, said Alexander, as he observed the merchant, who was a human with black hair and looked to be in his mid-forties. The merchant was shitting buckets right now, since he felt a heavy pressure on him, 
and felt that if he answered this question wrong, he might be killed. But before he could talk, the Trade Federation delegate that he was talking to before had decided to speak. Do you know who I am? I work for the Trade Federation, and I am related to Viceroy Newt Gunray, so anybody who touches me will be... He was cut off. One of the droids had hit him in the face with the back of their gun. The self-proclaimed relative of Viceroy Newt Gunray was knocked out on the floor. Now, back to what I was saying. I believe you contain this medical ingredient, said Alexander, showing the merchant Vasto the name of the medical ingredient. Seeing the name of what the person in front of him wanted, Vasto gulped, since this was his most precious merchandise that he had to sell two of his ships for and pay a large portion of his money just to get. But he also didn't want to lose his life to something like this. So if you tell me where in the building it is, then I will spare your life. But if you lie to me, then I will kill you and find it myself. So which one will it be? Said Alexander, as he looked serious when he said that last part. Vasto didn't waste any time and just gave up the location of it. I can show yo, you where it is, so please don't kill me. Okay, I will send one of my droids with you, and if you are lying, you will be killed immediately, said Alexander, threatening Vasto. Vasto quickly got up and led one of the droids to a room where he opened a crate that was full of the medical ingredient. Moments later, they came back, and the merchant sat back down as the droid reported what he saw. Sir, there was a crate full of it in the room, said the droid. Good, it seems you didn't lie after all, said Alexander. Suddenly, Cortana appeared on Alexander watch. Actually, he did lie, Master. There was more than one crate full of what we needed, yet he kept this a secret in hopes that we only take one, leaving the others with him. I found this out after I scanned the other crates when the droid walked in, reported Cortana. Alexander sighed since he was planning on letting the person live. I tried to give you a chance, but you lied to me. Wait, I was only trying to protect my business because I worked hard for that. It took me five years of selling slaves in the Outer Rim just to get that amount of money. Please don't kill me. And you were selling slaves, which is banned by the Republic. Alexander shook his head for the last time as he raised his hand and started chalking the merchant with the force. The merchant struggled for a couple of seconds before he finally died. All right, droids, I want you to gather all the crates that we need and wait until nighttime before you safely transport them back to the ship out of sight, said Alexander, since it would be too risky to do during daytime. Yes, sir, it will be done, replied the droid. And with that, Alexander left the building with Irina and Yona without anybody knowing and returned to walking around exploring the city. Chapter 31 Chapter 31 After exploring Coruscant for a little more, Alexander had returned to his ship safely without arousing any suspicion of Coruscant's security after he basically killed about 20 people, including the merchant. He also had the Trade Federation member killed so that he could spark a conflict between the Trade Federation and the Merchant Guild. Because not only was this a secret meeting, it was also only known by the top people in the Merchant's Guild and the Viceroy, and a few other high-ranking people in the Trade Federation. So naturally, the two would blame each other for this scandal, especially the Trade Federation, since it was a relative of his that got killed. And while either side is arguing with each other, Alexander will be long gone back to his capital before they even find out what really happened there. By the time Alexander had made it back to his ship, the sun was going down and it was turning nighttime. The droids had successfully gotten the cargo on the ship and they didn't even need to sneak it in since the security don't check cargo that is being loaded up unless it's absolutely needed or there is a suspicion. So after the droids successfully got the cargo on board, Alexander didn't waste any time and left the planet before something unexpected happened. The trip back to his capital was smooth and a safe trip without any contact with any hostile ships. Once Alexander was back in his home system, he was looking at the space that before was empty and filled with battle debris and felt lifeless. But now the system is brimming with life as military ships flew around patrolling the system and you could see transports taking new recruits to train on other planets and or moons in the system. 
The training included mock planetary invasion battles and planetary defense battles between the droids and the Rakata soldiers. The clones were still at a young age and wouldn't be able to train until a few months later. Above, orbiting the planet, were multiple small space stations and one massive space station. The one massive space station was the main space station that contained the main headquarters of the military high command that monitored and controlled all the military assets of the Ascendancy. It was called Nexus Command. And the smaller stations were defensive guns that would protect the planet from invasions. He also had a civilian station being constructed that would be for civilian use, housing lots of markets that will sell many things that Alexander will buy from traders and things that he will make himself. He can't rely fully on traders to supply his empire with commodities, as some will need to be produced by his empire, so as not to have to rely on outside help to fuel his economy. But back to Alexander. His ship had docked inside the Starforge, and he had the cargo unloaded into the station. There it was transported to the science lab on the station, where TB and Cortana had begun working on creating the cure for the Rakata disease to finally allow them to use the Force once again. Master Me and Cortana will get to work on synthesizing a cure right away, but considering the amount of work we have to do and tests, this could take longer than we originally thought, said TB. How long are we talking? responded Alexander. We initially thought around three to four weeks, but now it might be a couple of months to a year before we fully get a cure that we are sure will work 100 cent, said TB. That's fine. As long as you make that cure, then there isn't a problem. Just make sure that the cure will work and not cause any additional problems, said Alexander. Of course, Master, but before you go, I have completed a project that will help with your military expansion, said TB. Oh, really show it to me said Alexander as he walked up to TB. BT showed him the data pad, which contained all the information about the new military mech that would improve their military power during invasion of planets. As you see, Master, this new mech, which essentially is a massive droid, is as tall as a sit, why and can be deployed from our Harrow-class cruisers to any planet that we invade. And in addition to that, it has a ton of weapons and defenses, which will allow it to be immune to small gun laser fire and even some tank fire, but something like a ship's laser battery will be able to take it out easily. But enemy ground troops, especially force wielders, will not be able to beat it by themselves, explained TB. Looking at the mech, Alexander was excited since seeing something like this in action would surely be fun. Plus, from what he was seeing, just zero, two of these could probably take over an entire city by themselves. T like it, TB, but how many resources does it take to build just one? Asked Alexander. T takes a lot, but with our expansion into many systems, we have acquired a ton of resources and planets, which have also increased the Star Forge's production capacity up to 400 ships and 100 million droids, and those numbers keep increasing the more planets we conquer, explained TB. But right now we are limited to only making two so that we can preserve our resources to other areas such as the construction of orbital bases and ground bases on the newly conquered planets and the establishment of mining outposts both in space and on planetary surfaces. Hearing all of this, Alexander was glad that he left the managing of resources up to Cortana and TB since he didn't have the skills to manage all the resources, especially since his expansion fleet has been conquering planets daily and some of those planets have primitive species on them, mainly human and a few other known species. Okay, well produce those two for now, and I'll send out another fleet to speed up our expansion of the unknown regions to acquire more resources and population, said Alexander Cortana appeared on his wrist since she heard what he said. Master, do you want me to create another droid admiral to lead this new fleet? Asked Cortana. Yep, do that and send the fleet out to explore and expand, but if you come across any known empire in the unknown regions, make sure that you don't engage, because right now, we don't know exactly how strong each empire is, said Alexander. Yes, master, I will have them proceed with caution, responded Cortana. All right, if that's it, I will take my leave now and go see the clone's progress, said Alexander as he turned around and left. Cortana and TB had also left to finish their task, 
and to start research on the cure for the Rakata disease. Chapter 32 Chapter 32 After leaving the station, Alexander had immediately gone to the cloning labs and trained a little with the clones. Now obviously, since there were hundreds of thousands of clones, he couldn't just train with all of them, but he likes to make time for all of them because he isn't really busy for the most part. He spends most of his days training with Urena and Yona and learning new force abilities, while his nights are filled with him punishing Urena and Yona. So as for his days, he had a lot of time. But the clones aren't the only ones he spends his time with, as he also spends his time training with the force users. And not everybody was a quick learner, so most of them were struggling with the force. But there were a few who proved to be exceptional and fast learners at using the force. One in particular was a 15-year-old boy who had the most midi-chlorians of all the Force users, numbering at 12K. So Alexander immediately took him under his wing to personally train him into a powerful Force user. And so as the days went on, it eventually turned into months, which showed a significant growth in the Force user's abilities, and the clones were now fully grown. The training of the Force users went well, besides a few who had to succumb to the dark side, and had to be eliminated. Alexander expected something like this to happen, since for most people, learning balance in the Force was quite hard and only a few could achieve it. So of the original 200, only 187 were left. But that wasn't all the Force users, as the more he conquers planets in the unknown regions, he gets access to more Force users, so he had in all around 2K Force users who live and train in the Guardian Temple. Also, so far the Guardians only have around 50 Knights that have earned that rank. The rest are still in their training stages of learning to balance between the good and the bad. But, give it a couple of more years, and he will have more Knights. Jedi training takes around two decades before they are even considered a Knight, so I took that and just made it five years to train to the rank of Knight. But some can become Knights faster if they prove themselves which is why he currently has only 50, but in the coming years, expect more knights. The droids that Alexander sent to trade with traders have started to earn a reputation after the ships that they started selling became popular among the galaxy because of their speed and improved systems. Because of this, many started requesting more of the ships and seeking out the droid traders, but nobody could find them until Alexander had negotiated a deal with the planet of Jakku and established a shipyard above the planet. The shipyard was called Olympus. This caught the attention of many traders, who immediately sought out this shipyard to start requesting ships, fighters, and other craft, except military warships, since those were exclusive to Alexander. But not all visitors were friendly, as some pirates came to take over the shipyard, but they were thwarted by Alexander's security forces that he called Olympus Security Forces, or OSF for short. But ships weren't the only thing that Alexander started selling to traders, as he also started selling some of the excessive and rare resources that he found in the unknown regions of the galaxy. This brought in a lot of money for Alexander, and brought a lot of attention to Jakku, which before was just a distant and relatively worthless planet, but now it has lots of ships coming to and from the planet. Now some might be thinking, did Alexander only build a shipyard? Well, no, since there was also a civilian section of the station where traders docked. There were also large cargo holds on the station, which contained the resource of the mining operation from the planet, which would be sold by the planet's mining companies. Alexander only offered an easier and safer place to store them. News of the Olympus station has been spreading over the galaxy for months now, attracting a lot of attention to the station and to the planet. Jack. Q. Now for the clones, Alexander has sent some of them on garrison missions on the currently owned Ascendancy worlds, but most of them were only for protecting the mining stations and bases that he owned. Some planets had former tribal civilizations that have been undergoing development to make them get used to space. But there was a problem, as during one of the expedition fleet's contact with the planet of Zakul, they came into contact with the Shi Ruvi Imperium, who had occupied the planet with a fleet of 200 ships. 
This wasn't a surprise to Alexander, because he knew he would run into them eventually, but he didn't expect them to attack and occupy the planet of Zakul, which he planned to bring into his empire. And he knows that with the occupation of Zakul, it wouldn't be long until somebody like the Republic finds out and sends a relief fleet or the Empire who will liberate the planet. He wanted to keep his empire hidden for a little longer, but if he wants to, the planet of Zakul, he will have to act now. And that is exactly what he did, since now the limitation of the Starforge had increased a lot, as he could now build around 2k ships and around 2 billion droids. So Alexander immediate started production of his army to take Zakul from the Sea Ruvi Imperium, which will start a possibly long war with them until they are finally conquered. Chapter 33 Chapter 33 After two weeks, Alexander had amassed his fleet of 400 ships, which he would take to Zakul and liberate the planet from the Shi Ruvi Imperium, which had a fleet of 200 ships above the planet. The Galactic Republic has been trying to find a peaceful means to end the occupation of the planet, but politics takes time, and right now with the Republic greatly fractured because of the Great Separation, many senators are reluctant to send aid to a single planet. In just two weeks, the Republic have accomplished nothing as they continue to argue and debate whether they should send aid, but slowly more senator were switching to send since they didn't want the Galactic Empire to liberate the planet, which would boost their support around the galaxy, and also decrease the Republic influence even further than it already is. As for the Galactic Empire, the Emperor has a strategic reasoning for wanting to liberate the planet, which is the fact that Zakul is has a unique connection to the Force, being balanced between the light and dark sides of the Force. And it also contains ancient knowledge about the Knights of Zakul, which Palpatine could use against the Jedi. This was also the reason why Alexander wanted to liberate the planet because of its balance between the Force, which would be the perfect place to train his guardians into the perfect balanced Force users. Above the planet Lehan, the capital of the Terran Ascendancy, Alexander was inside his new capital ship, which he named the Imperator. The ship in question was a new ship produced called the Asserter class Star Dreadnought. Image here. While it wasn't bigger than the First Order's Supremacy class Dreadnought, it had the firepower and shields to match it and maybe even overpower it. In Alexander's fleet were also carriers, cruisers, and transport ships, which would carry the troops down towards the planet. He also had ten Executor class Star Dreadnoughts placed in key locations in the fleet formation but two remained with his capital ship. Alexander also had a secondary fleet of 500 ships on standby, just in case an unforeseen event such as the Empire also attacked the planet, or the Cyruvi Imperium sent reinforcements to hold the planet. On board the deck of the ship was Clone Admiral Jacob, who was standing in front of a screen looking at the condition of the fleet and making sure everybody was prepared to depart. He was the first admiral appointed to a high position such as this, and he earned it through his recommendation from the Naval Academy. Behind him, the automatic door opened, revealing a person being escorted in by two well-known force users in the Ascendancy. Admiral Jacob immediately saluted upon seeing the person, Your Highness, the ship is yours. This is what was taught at the Naval Academy, that any time the Emperor comes aboard, they are to transfer control to him, no matter the ship, unless the Emperor says otherwise. At ease, Admiral Jacob, tell me, how is the fleet coming along? asked Alexander. Sir, the fleet is finishing loading the last few cargo containers that we currently need, and should be done within minutes, otherwise than that all ships in the fleet have reported that all personnel are active and ready, and all equipment, including fighters, ground vehicles, and transports are all accounted for, said Jacob, as he placed both his hands behind his back, standing at attention. Good, tell me when all the cargo is done loading, so we can head out, said Alexander, as he walked towards a chair that was specifically designed for him. Yes, sir, I will inform you. Also, it's a pleasure to meet you again, Lady Urena and Lady Yona. I trained with you a few months ago at the academy, said Jacob Urena and Yona thought for a while before they remembered him. Yes, I remember you, Admiral Jacob. You are the one who aced the Naval Academy test 
and received a recommendation to become the first clone admiral, if I recall. Well, you have a big task ahead of you, so good luck, said Yona, since she was the one who looked at the recommendation and Axie, Ted it. As the first clone admiral, you have a lot of weight on your shoulders, so best of luck to you. And remember, we all make mistakes, but how we own up to them is how we learn and improve ourselves, said Yurina. Yes, my ladies, I will always remember your kind words. Thank you, said Admiral Jacob as he saluted them. Irina and Yona smiled before they returned to their seats, which were placed next to Alexander's. Alexander had pulled up the holographic screen and began to look through all the ships in the fleet. A few seconds later, and the final cargo shipment was done. Your Highness, all preparations are complete, and the fleet is awaiting your command to move out, said Admiral Jacob. All right, said Alexander as he tapped on the holographic screen, opening a message to the entire fleet. Attention fleet, this is the Emperor speaking. For many years, we have hidden in the shadows of the unknown regions, slowly expanding our territory without the galaxy knowing, and we have avoided fighting other powerful empires in the unknown regions. But now we are powerful enough that we can challenge those empires and beat them. The planet of Zakul is currently under occupation by the Sai Ruvi Imperium, a rival empire located somewhere in the unknown region. The Galactic Republic has already been informed of this and have been asked and pressured by the Galactic community to do something about this. But it has been two weeks, and the only thing they have done is debate on the matter, while innocent people are either killed and enslaved based on reports from our spy droids. This is something that I do not tolerate, which is slavery. So today we are going to liberate the planet of Zakul and bring it under our control freeing the people from the Shi Ruvi Imperium. And after we take the planet, we won't stop there, as we will take the fight to the Shi Ruvi Imperium and completely destroy them. This is one of the many wars to come that we will win, so let's show them our might and defeat these invaders. Everybody on the ship started cheering and became even more eager for the battle ahead. Admiral Jacob, prepare the fleet to jump into hyperspace. Yes, sir said Admiral Jacob, saluting. He then returned to his station and issued orders to the entire fleet to prepare to jump to hyperspace. The pilots had started prepping the ship, all systems green across the board. Reactor levels are stable, engaging engines. The ship started to move forward at a low speed before it increased. After a couple of minutes, the entire fleet was in position to jump into hyperspace. All ships, jump to hyperspace said Admiral Jacob as the entire fleet jumped into hyperspace. Chapter 34 Chapter 34 Above the planet of Zakul, 200 ships of the C. Ruvi Imperium were in orbit, blockading the planet. Admiral Zaku, who was leading the C. Ruvi Imperium fleet, was in a meeting with the Shriftut, which was the title of the ruler of the C. Ruvi Imperium. Admiral, I hope everything is going smoothly with the occupation of Zakul, asked the Shriftut. Yes, Your Majesty. We have begun loading and processing the people on the surface to be brought back to the Imperium as slaves, and so far no foreign fleets have entered the system, so everything should go smoothly, said Admiral Zaku. Good, we will use these newly acquired slave for labor to build more spaceships and start expanding our Imperium into the unknown regions to investigate this new threat that our priests have had visions about, said the Shreve Tut. So speed up the process. Admiral, before somebody comes to the planet's aid, said the Shreve Tut. Yes, your majesty, I will deploy more men to speed up the process, said Admiral Zaku as he bowed and the hollow screen in front of him disappeared. After the screen disappeared, Admiral Zaku walked out of the room into the command room of the ship, where he sat down in his chair. He looked over to one of the crew before he started giving orders. Deploy more forces to the ground to speed up the processing of the population and have General Rossoy to contact me in the communications room. Ordered Admiral Zaku. The crew operating in the command room acknowledged his orders, started contacting the officers and the other ships to deploy more forces to the ground. Admiral Zaku stared outside the window, looking at the planet with a menacing smile on his face, as he was excited because this is the first time that the Ciruvi Imperium invaded a planet that was close to the core systems and empires. They don't know much about the core systems, 
but they know of the Republic which occupies the core systems and of the Great Separation. If it was before the Great Separation, they would not have invaded Zakul. But now that the Republic is weak, they can invade planets that are in wild space and avoid the Republic sending a powerful fleet to stop them. Just as the Admiral was staring at the planet, one of the crew members who operate the radar had interrupted him. Admiral, a massive fleet has just entered the system from one of the hyperspace lanes and are heading in this direction. Admiral Zaku didn't panic and instead stayed calm. How many ships are in this fleet? Around 400 ships are in this fleet and some of them are massive ships. What do we do, Admiral? Send out a call for reinforcements and get the fleet into defensive formations, ordered the Admiral. We won't have time to evacuate all the troops on the surface of the planet, so let's hold out until reinforcements get here, ordered Admiral Zaku. Admiral Zaku stood up from his seat and stared outside the window, looking at the approaching fleet, which had ships bigger than those in his fleet. Those reinforcements better get here fast, thought Admiral Zaku, since he doesn't know how long they can last. Meanwhile, on the Imperator, Alexander was listening to all the chatter that was going on as the fleet was already in combat mode and had begun launching fighters. Your Highness, the enemy fleet has managed to send out a message before we were able to block their communications, so we can expect enemy reinforcements to be on their way at this moment. Reported Admiral Jacob Alexander knew something like this could happen, since after exiting hyperspace, it would take a few minutes before they are able to jam their communications, so he wasn't that worried about the enemy reinforcements. Till have the backup fleet start heading towards the system, so continue to attack the fleet in orbit of the planet so that we can start to land ground troops on the planet, ordered Alexander. Yes, your highness. Also, with the help of Cortana, we have managed to get information on the enemy ship's combat capabilities, and the enemy sh IPS are much smaller than our average ship, so we should be able to win without taking any casualties, reported Admiral Jacob. That's good but this could just be a smaller fleet compared to the reinforcements that they will get, so keep your eyes opened at all times just in case, said Alexander. Admiral Jacob nodded and returned to his station, since in a few minutes they would be in the weapons range of the enemy fleet. Alexander was looking at his hollow screen, which showed all the fighters launching from his fleet and getting into attack formation. A few minutes later, and they were a couple of seconds from being in weapon range. Once they entered weapon range, Alexander thought to himself, let the battle commence. Chapter 35, Chapter 35 As the first laser cannons fired from each fleet, the fighters from both sides started engaging each other, fighting for air superiority. But the number of ascendancy fighters were three dax the amount of fighters and bombers that the Ceruvi Imperium had, so they were greatly outnumbered. Ascendancy fighters were even able to advance to close range of the Shi Ruvi Imperium ships and bomb some of them within the first minutes of the battle. Alexander watched as the bigger cruisers of his fleet advanced in formation toward the enemy fleet, while the bigger battleships and battle cruisers were behind them. The support ships were placed behind the fleet in a safe place to protect them from enemy fighters and bombers that managed to get close enough. The Cyruvi Imperium ships were being beaten badly as their technology was no match for the Terran ships, but that didn't mean they were ineffective as so far they managed to take down a frigate which was too exposed to the enemy fleet. But even that didn't compare to the amount of ships that the Terran Ascendancy managed to destroy within 30 minutes of the battle, which numbered nearly 60. Admiral Zaku seeing the condition his fleet was in knew that they wouldn't be able to hold out much longer, but if they don't, then the enemy fleet will have control of the system and be able to invade the planet. He only hoped that reinforcements came in time to assist them, but little did he know, reinforcements were not even on the way. Prelude to the Battle of Zakul at the Si Ruvi Imperium homeworld of Lewek. His Majesty the Shriftut was talking with one of his advisors. Your Majesty, the small fleet we sent to take the planet called Zakul is currently being attacked by a fleet which has the same ships that we have seen from the unknown fleet 
which roams the unknown regions with its superior technology, reported the advisor. So there could be a possible connection between this enemy fleet and that unknown fleet, which goes from system to system taking them over, said the Shreeftoot. The advisor nodded his head while bowing. Yes, and if they can send a big fleet of 400 ships out, then they must have a backup fleet waiting somewhere. So when we attriv with a reinforcement fleet, we will be attacked by an overwhelming enemy fleet. But that is only my guess. T have thought of the same thing. But by not sending a fleet, then we will lose loyal soldiers who are on the surface of the planet. So I will send a reinforcements, but not to fight, but to delay the enemy fleet so that we can get our ground troops off of the planet and regroup. That is a good plan, your majesty, said the advisor. While I do that, I want you to try and investigate where this strange fleet came from so that we can find their homeworld or base and attack them with our full force, said the Shreve Toot. T will get on it right away, your majesty. Good, I will await your results. With that, the advisor bowed and walked out of the room to carry out his task, while the Shreve Toot continued thinking about where possibly could these fleets have been hiding? Back to the Battle of Zakul. It's been nearly an hour since the battle has begun, and the remaining enemy ships have decided to give up instead of fighting to their deaths. Admiral Zaku unfortunately killed himself after he crashed his ship into a battle cruiser, which destroyed the battle cruiser but killed him in the process. After seeing that no other ship had the will to fight, so they surrendered allowing Terran droids to board their ships and take all the crew of the ships into custody and transported into cells. Now that they had control over the system, Alexander began preparations to land his army at a resistance location, which contained a small army of people who armed themselves and starting resisting the enemy occupation. He already contacted them and told them that he was here to help, and the resistance responded by wanting to meet with him on the planet. So Alexander, who is now on his way down to the play, Net's surface was being escorted by 10 fighters and 15 gunships. Following behind him were many transports carrying droids and soldiers. It didn't take him long to arrive at the resistance base, which was well hidden in the dense forest of Zakul. Alexander's transport landed in an open field just next to the base, while the escorting fighters had split off and started scouting the area for enemy movement or anything suspicious. The gunships had landed next to Alexander's ship and dropped off the soldiers, who lined up at the door of Alexander's transport in two lines. The resistance was looking at the soldiers in confusion, wondering who was the person coming out of the ship. And just as they were thinking this, their resistance leader had come forward and stood at the end of the line of soldiers waiting. Alexander didn't want to keep the resistance leader waiting, so he exited his ship and began walking past the line of soldiers, who were all saluting. Trailing behind him were Urena and Yona and a couple HK assassin droids. Chapter 36, Chapter 36 Couple minutes before the landing, Master what will you do with the people on this planet? Asked Yona, since she was curious, Alexander already had an idea of what to do with the people on this planet, and of course he would bring them into his empire but he might let them retain the right to govern themselves, since all he is worried about is the planet's strategic importance and its potential force users that they might have. So he might allow them to be the first vassal planet of his empire if everything goes well. It will depend on this meeting that will determine what I do, but if everything goes well, then I might let them retain the right to govern themselves in exchange. I shall protect them and have authority over the planet said Alexander. Sounds to me like they have no other choice, considering their situation, said Irina. Well, I wouldn't put it like that, but I guess you can see it that way, since they are in a difficult situation, and I know for a fact that the enemy army has probably already detected is, so they might be moving forces this way, so there is no room for long negotiations, said Alexander. He basically had the Zakul resistance forces backed into a corner, since if they refused his demands, then they would be defeated and become enemies of the invading Terran forces. But if they accept his demands, they will receive significant help in liberating their planet. 
Alexander really didn't want to do anything and just wanted to sit back and relax. But as a leader, meeting with the resistance leader would be good for his popularity on the planet, and it will make his meeting with the resistance better, since he personally came, but for future battles, he will just send a subordinate. Walking down the ramp of the ship was Alexander, with Urena and Yona to his right and left, and a dozen HK assassin droids behind him. After a few minutes, he had approached the resistance leader and extended his hand to show that he was friendly. The resistance leader did the same, and they both shook hands. You must be the one who I talked to before, asked the resistance leader. Yes, I am, and I'm glad that we could meet in person. My name is Emperor Alexander. Hearing his title, the resistance leader had bowed his head slightly. My name is Commander Gilsom, and I'm sorry for not knowing earlier your majesty Alexander, but this is the first time I am hearing about an emperor of your name in the galaxy. It's fine, since until now I have hidden from the other powerful forces of the galaxy, said Alexander. TC, so that's the reason why, said Commander Gilsom. Anyway, your majesty time is of the essence, so if you will please follow me, so that we can sit down and talk somewhere else, said Commander Gilsom. Please lead the way, said Alexander, as he followed Commander Gilsom into the resistance base. Along the way, Alexander could see that most of the Resistance soldiers were under-equipped and using worn-out weapons and armor, which would not be good if the base was suddenly attacked. But other than that, the base was well hidden, since it was covered by a lot of trees, which would be hard to spot from above. After a few minutes of walking, they had arrived at a room where Commander Gilsom sat across from Alexander at the table. So, Your Majesty, I'm sure you know of our situation just by looking at the git equipment of our soldiers, said Commander Gilsom. Alexander nodded. Yes, they are very under-equipped. And I'm sorry to say this, but they won't last if the enemy attack this base with their full force. Commander Gilsom sighed. It's even worse for the other resistance leaders since they are trying to take back key locations on the planet, but they don't have the equipment. Well, that's why I'm here, so that the Resistance can win with the support of my army, said Alexander. Commander Gilsom was happy to hear this, but he knew that there must be a catch. That is great, but I'm assuming you want something in return, Alexander smiled. You are correct. My proposal to you is that in return for helping T, he Resistance, the planet of Zakul, shall fall under my empire's rule but I will allow the planet and its people to retain a government and hold elections for leaders. As such, all I want is Zakul to be part of my empire, said Alexander Commander Gilsom, knew that there was a catch, but he didn't expect this. The offer was good since they will maintain their own government, but they will be a part of Alexander's empire, something which they know nothing about. And what if I refuse your offer? said Commander Gilsom, as the resistance guards tightened their grips on their guns. Then I will leave, but my forces will still take over the planet, and your resistance will either be treated as enemies or as neutral forces, depending on certain circumstances, explained Alexander. So it's either join me or become my enemy, basically, said Commander Gilsom. If that's how you want to see it, then I guess you can say that. Responded, Alexander Commander. Gilsom wasn't a politician, but he was born on this planet, and he knew how the previous government failed to protect them from the invasion forcing him to lead a resistance against the enemy. Now he was in front of a person of power who could help his planet, and would allow them to maintain a government on their planet led by the people of Zakul. He wasn't stupid, nor was he smart, but he knew that accepting this would be the best option for him and the people of Zakul. Your Majesty Alexander, I accept your offer, but I don't know if the other resistance leaders will accept so easily, said Commander Gilsom. That's good and about the other resistance leaders, just try to get them on my side, and if not, then I am afraid that I will have to consider them to be rebels against the new Zakul government, and they will be taken prisoner. Said Alexander, well we don't all get along with each other since we all have different ideals, so I don't care as long as the people of Zakul are free once again. Good as long as I am here, the people of Zakul will be freed, and first let me give your men some proper weapons, 
said Alexander, as he was about to have Urena order some weapons to be transported to his location, but Cortana appeared in front of him. Master, there is enemy movement detected approaching the resistance base. I have already diverted some troops towards this direction with some fighters IGM and bombers, said Cortana. Okay, and have the soldiers who came with me to deploy around the base and get ready to defend, said Alexander. Yes, Master, said Cortana as she disappeared. Alexander looked at Commander Gilsom, who was shocked from what he saw. Commander Gilsom, the enemy is heading towards this base. But don't worry, my army is on the way, but still have your men ready to fight," said Alexander. Commander Gilsom didn't waste time and immediately started issuing orders to the resistance soldiers. Alexander returned to his transport ship, where he would wait and watch the battle. Chapter 37 Chapter 37 Alexander was sitting in the deck of his ship, while outside his ship, dozens of soldiers and droids were surrounding his ship, protecting it from the enemy attack. Alexander had the gunship circle the area scouting for the enemy and report back what they saw. The resistance soldiers were preparing their defenses for the battle ahead. All over the base, one could see resistance. Soldiers running around the base getting into their defenses while the base alarms were going off. After a few minutes, the first line of defense was successfully set up, which contained resistance soldiers mixed in with Alexander's droids. Almost twenty minutes had passed, and there was no sign of enemy movement around the base, making some doubt whether or not the enemy was coming. Unfortunately, the timing of the soldiers' thinking wasn't the best since the front line had started getting attacked by enemy soldiers. While above in the sky, the enemy fighters were escorting bombers in to bomb the resistance base, but the Terran fighters that were stationed in the area were already heading to intercept them and they arrived just in time as the enemy was nearing the resistance base. The enemy tried to distract the Terran fighters in order to get their bombers through. But the sheer number of Terran fighters were overwhelming. Plus, with the support from the resistance, anti-fighter guns, the enemy fighters and bombers were stopped from completing their mission. On the ground at the front line, the resistance soldiers mixed with Alexander's droids were holding against the enemy attack, which had intensified since enemy shock troopers had started attacking the front line, killing a lot of resistance soldiers and destroying a lot of droids. The front line wouldn't last that long against the enemy since some of them started to retreat to the second line of defense. But luckily, they wouldn't need to hold out any longer since approaching from the east were hundreds of Terran transports, fighters, and gunships that were coming from a nearby city that they conquered. Commander Gilsom was already told by Alexander that those were his reinforcements, so he told his resistance soldiers to not shoot the incoming reinforcement. But the transports were still a few seconds out, so the Terran fighters and bombers rushed ahead of the transports, breaking their escort formation and started supporting the front line. At this time, a fresh wing of enemy fighters had made its way to the battlefield and started dogfighting with the Terran fighters that were already there. And within seconds, the reinforcing Terran fighters coming from the east had made its way to the front line and started supporting their allies. While the fighters began fighting with the enemy fighters and the bombers started bombing the approaching enemy troops, the Terran transports had made their way to the resistance base and started to land all around the base where there was space. The gunships went to the front line and started offloading small amounts of troops, and after they offloaded these troops, the gunships started supporting the front line, destroying the enemy heavy vehicles. So far, the enemy hasn't been able to send out their own gunships since the Terran fighters currently maintained a heavy air presence over the battlefield, preventing enemy gunships from reinforcing the front line. The battle started to turn in the favor of the resistance, thanks to the support of the Terran army. The general of this Terran army had immediately gone to report to Alexander, who was still on his transport ship, watching the battle. And since he was a general, he was allowed aboard the transport, and he walked to the bridge of the ship where Alexander was at. Your Highness the 15th Legion has arrived, 
and are supporting the front lines as we speak, and we should have control over the battlefield once our heavy artillery and vehicles get offloaded from the transports. Reported General Zed Alexander, who was looking at the many screens in front of him, which showed T, he battlefield, had turned around in his chair, facing the general. Very good, General Zed, you have arrived on time, said Alexander. To would have been sooner, your highness, but after liberating the city east of here, it took us some time to load all of our troops back up and make it over here. General Zed was really rushing once he heard that the emperor was under attack, even leaving behind some of the slower troops to stay in the city. It's fine, General Zed. My safety was never at risk anyway, said Alexander, since it was true that his safety was never threatened. Of course, your highness, I was just being cautious since you are the most important person on this planet right now, so your safety is our top concern, said General Zed. T. No, that's why I appreciate all the soldiers and leaders in the army for putting my safety above all else, even if I am the most protected person on the planet, but forgetting about small talk. General, we have a battle to win and a planet to liberate, so let's get back to it, said Alexander. Yes, your highness, I will return with news of our victory soon, said General Zed as he bowed and left the transport ship to the front line to start pushing the enemy back. While on the enemy side, their general has been furious since they are losing the battle both on the land and in the air, and he has lost thousands of troops already. But he has a trick up his sleeve that will turn the tide of the battle. Chapter 38 Chapter 38 A.N. This chapter will be explaining some things about the MC that I may have left out, such as his abilities, views on the Jedi and Sith, the lightsaber forms that he has learned, and such. I also explained a bit about the Force in Chapter 4, if anybody needs to reread it. First, let's talk about his Force abilities. Alexander has learned lots of Force abilities, some of them being what the Jedi may consider to be Sith abilities. Some of the major ones are long-lost Force powers, such as Force healing, which in turn allowed Alexander to completely heal and or regenerate any lost or damaged limb, body part. He was also able to manifest new Force powers not known to the Jedi or the Sith, some of them being more deadly Force powers, while some being more passive ones. Example of these Force powers are Force Lightning, Force Barrier, Focused Raged, which increased the user's aggression and potency while simultaneously decreasing the damage they sustained, Telepathy, the very basic ability to read and interact with other minds, mentally communicate and project the user's thoughts over small or vast distances with other individuals. An example of telepathy abilities would be mind trick. If the force user is powerful enough, they can even alter or erase memories. Drain knowledge, which allowed the force user to drain knowledge from any individual through violent means. Some of the general force powers that he learned included force, which stasis allowed a force user to slow down or completely freeze an object, person, or even pure energy in place. Mind probe was a force power which allowed the user to search the thoughts of others. It was possible to resist this ability using the force. Powerful force users could even turn the effects of the probe around and manage a look into the mind of the user. Force Sense was the ability used to feel another being's feelings, the future, ripples in the force caused by momentous or traumatic events, impending danger, and the presence of the dark side. Second is his views about the Jedi and Sith. Alexander is what people may call a gray Jedi, someone balanced in the force, and he is training other force users to become balanced in the force also. So he doesn't hate the Jedi or the Sith, and in fact may work with them if things come to it or depending on how things in the future unfold. But he does view some things that the Jedi do, such as taking children from their homes and training to become Jedi, is something that he doesn't support. The killing of innocent people, something that the Sith sometimes do, is something that he doesn't support. To sum it up, he is relatively neutral to the Jedi and Sith, but in the future his view about them may change, depending on certain circumstances. Third and last is his lightsaber form. There are two forms that he is currently learning, and those are Form 6 and Form 4. Form 6, also known as Neiman, was the sixth form of lightsaber combat used by members of the Jedi Order. 
It could be used to combine double-bladed lightsaber combat with other force abilities, like pushes and lifts. An example of this would be Darth Maul. Form 4, also known as Ataru, pronounced Ut Tar Zero, or the aggression form, was the fourth form of lightsaber combat invented by the Jedi Order. An acrobatic combat style, Ataru could be used to defend against incoming projectiles but was best suited for open spaces and attacking. An example of this form would be Anakin's fighting form and Kanan Jarrus from Star Wars Rebels. So with all of these abilities, he could have a seat on the Jedi Council if he followed the Jedi Code, but he doesn't, so the chance of that happening is zero. The Jedi would consider Alexander a threat depending on who they are and how strongly they view the Jedi. People such as Master Yoda would see it as an opportunity, and he would try to befriend Alexander, while Mace might have a different view on the matter. Other members of the High Council, depending on their views and personality, might also have various opinions of the matter. But leaving that aside, Alexander's strength is way above average because of the amount of midi-chlorians in his body, numbering 50,000. Because of this, the Force has amplified his body's physical strength, his mental strength, and his lifespan. So the average Jedi and Sith stand no chance against him by themselves, but somebody of higher power and experience, such as Palpatine, Yoda, Mace Windu, Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Qui-Gon Jinn, could potentially give a challenge to Alexander. A.N. Hope that explains some of the unanswered questions that some people had, and if you have any more, don't be afraid to ask in the comments. Chapter 39 Chapter 39 General Zeed went to the front line, where his soldiers were defending from the enemy attack, awaiting his orders to start advancing. But General Zeed was waiting for the artillery and tanks to get into position before he started pushing forward. After a few more minutes of waiting, the transports had offloaded the tanks and artillery battalions. As soon as they were offloaded, the battalion commanders were immediately given orders to report to their designated positions. It didn't take them long to reach their positions, and once they were all there, they contacted General Zeed and reported that they were in position. Hearing this, General Zeed had a smile on his face as now he can finally push these weak enemies back to their main base. General Zeed made a broadcast to all battalion commanders and ordered them to charge. The resistance soldiers were confused on what was going on since all of a sudden their allies ran out of cover and started pushing the enemy back. Some of the resistance soldiers followed them without hesitation, while some others hesitated a bit, but in the end, they followed the Terran soldiers as well. General Zeed was at the temporary headquarters of that he established at the front line. But it wasn't the front line anymore, since the Terran army had pushed back the Sea Ru, establishing a new front line further away from the resistance base. In the sky, the Terran fighters had achieved complete domination, and now the gunships could support the troops at the new front line. The bombers started bombing runs behind the enemy line, cutting off any reinforcements and supplies, and even bombing the front line. This lasted for about two hours before the Sairu finally gave up and started to retreat. General Zeed allowed them to retreat and sent stealth soldiers to track the retreating soldiers to find their base. And now with the battle over, General Zeed reported back to Alexander. Your Highness, the battle is over, and our forces are victorious. Reported General Zeed as he bowed. Good. Now, General, I want you to track them back to their base, and once you do, you have my permission to attack with all available forces, and once you do, then help our resistance friends in reclaiming some of their cities. But beware, not all resistance groups are friends, so proceed with caution, General said Alexander. Of course, your highness, I already have men tracking the enemy now, and once I am done, I will help the resistance, responded General Zeed. Good, now I will return to my ship to watch the remainder of the invasion, so good luck, General, said Alexander. Your words are too kind, your highness, said General Zeed, as he took his leave off the ship. Once he was gone, Alexander ordered the pilot to take him back to his ship in space. The pilot acknowledged his orders, and they proceeded to take off and head into space. Irina, who was standing next to Alexander, was wondering what he was truly planning, since she could sense that he had other plans for the people of Zakul than what he told the resistance commander. 
Master, what is it that you really want to do with the planet of Zakul? Asked Urena Yona also looked at Alexander, since she was also wondering the same thing, since they have the superior forces, so taking over the planet would be an easy feat for them, and they could win the people over within a couple of years or so. Alexander hearing the question that Urena was asking wasn't surprised that she asked this since they have spent a lot of time together and they knew when he had ulterior motives. So you figured out that I was planning something else, said Alexander as he stopped what he was doing and looked at Urena. But now is not the place to discuss such things, so let's wait until we are in a private area, said Alexander. Urena and Yona nodded since as his servants they were curious as to what Alexander wanted to do, but of course if he refused they also knew their place as servants and wouldn't ask about it again. But Alexander always told them that if they have any hing to ask them, then don't be afraid, since he won't punish them for questioning his actions. He said this because he is new to being an emperor, so if they have a better plan, or simply want to know his plans, then he would gladly tell them. But that was only for Urena and Yona. Any other person that questions him will be seen as disrespect. Back on the surface of the planet, Commander Zed had started making plans with Commander Gilsum to start contacting the other resistance leaders to start combining forces, and those that don't agree will be considered enemies of the Terran army. But somewhere on Zakul, a resistance leader of another group was a woman, and she was wielding a lightsaber fighting off some of the Siru with resistance soldiers behind her. Every swing of her lightsaber ended with a dead Siru. After striking down the last Siru, she had turned off her lightsaber and looked to the sky as she felt two familiar presences leaving the planet. We will meet soon, my sisters, said the woman as she started shouting orders at the other resistance soldiers to move forward. Marina and Yona had also felt a familiar presence, but only for a second, before it disappeared. Because of this they couldn't figure out who it was, but they knew that it was a powerful force user, so they told Alexander about it as they headed out of the planet's atmosphere. DH Chapter 40 Chapter 40 Alexander had returned to his ship and received a report on his armies on the ground. So far five generals have landed on the surface of the planet and liberated five cities on the surface of the planet already. Four of these cities were minor cities, while one of them was a major city held by the enemy. Taking the major city crippled some of the enemy supplies, and the Terran Empire was able to take a lot of prisoners. The fighting on the ground was intense, as all over the planet battles were ongoing, either between the Terran army and the Siru, or the resistance cells and the Siru. The resistance cells were making little progress, as their soldiers were under-equipped versus the Siru who were fully equipped and had better tactics. But because of the Terran army landing on the planet, the Siru have divided their attention between the resistance cells and the Terran army, making it easier for the resistance cells to retake minor cities which aren't heavily defended. The Terran army, on the other hand, within the first week of landing, have made a lot of progress on the surface of the planet, capturing many Siru and transporting them back to Lahan for Alexander to determine what to do with them. And after the first week, Alexander saw that his presence wasn't necessary anymore, so he returned to Lahan to train with some of the other force users. He left Yona to lead the Terran forces in the system in his absence. After returning to Lahan, Alexander mostly spent his time doing nothing but being spoiled by the maids of his palace who took care of everything for him. He did this because most of his time was spent learning new force techniques, some which took a lot of concentration and was mentally exhausting. And since overworking was the death of him in his previous life, he didn't spend too much time on mastering new force abilities, but just enough to make a good amount of progress. After three more weeks, the Terran army had officially been on the planet for an entire month, and the war over the planet was nearing its end. Most of the resistance cells have either joined the Terran generals in liberating the planet, while those that didn't agree were killed, and their resistance soldiers absorbed into other resistance cells. However, the third sister of Urena and Yona have yet to join the Terran army, 
and instead she hides in the shadows watching the Terran army advance. While the war on Zakul enters its fourth week, the Republic and the Galactic Empire have learned of the existence of a new power thanks to their scouts. Upon hearing this, the Galactic Empire looked to investigate this new empire as the Emperor wanted to see whether they were a threat to his plans, but they don't have any information on them nor where their homeworld is located, so for they focused on investigating their fleet and army. The Republic have sent Jedi envoys to Zakul in hopes of making contact with this new empire and learning of their intentions, and the two Jedis they sent were of course a young Obi-Wan Kenobi and Qui-Gon Jinn, who is still alive because the Naboo incident did not happen yet. The Jedi High Council entrusted these two with meeting with this new empire for a friendly first contact. Once the envoy ship entered Zakul space, it was immediately intercepted by Terran ships. But upon hearing who they were, Yona had them escorted to the main fleet and brought aboard her command ship. In the hangar of the command ship, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon had exited their transport ship and were greeted by droids saluting them, which confused them, since when they looked around, all they saw were a lot of droids and a few human soldiers here and there. That's when Admiral Jacob approached the two, who were confused as he was sent to greet them by Yona. Welcome, envoys of the Republic. My name is Admiral Jacob of the Terran Navy, said Jacob as he extended his hand to shake both of theirs. Quigon and Obi-Wan did the same and shook Admiral Jacob's hand while stating their name. Hello, Admiral Jacob. I am Jedi Master Qui Ji. On Jin, and this is Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi said Qui-Gon, since Obi-Wan had already graduated from his Padawan status and was a Jedi Master now. Greetings, Admiral Jacob, said Obi-Wan. T was sent here by my Lady Yona to bring you to her, who is already in a meeting room waiting on you too, said Admiral Jacob. Well, let's not keep her waiting, said Qui-Gon, as he followed Admiral Jacob to where Yon was waiting. While walking through the halls of the ship, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan were fascinated by the interior design of the ship, which was complex, but allowed more room for lots of crew and soldiers. After a few more seconds, they made it to an elevator and took it to another floor. After exiting the elevator, they were taken to a room where two droids were already stationed and waiting. Once at the door, the droids scanned the face of Admiral Jacob before allowing him in the room, followed by Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. In the room was Yona sitting down at a table, drinking some tea. Admiral Jacob guided the two Jedi to sit down at the table while he exited the room, leaving Yona to speak with them. Yona took her last sip of the tea before she put the cup down and looked at the two Jedi in front of her. Jedi Master, Qui-Gon, and Kenobi, my name is Yona, the current commander of the military forces in this system, and I'm curious as to what brings the Republic to this planet, now of all times, when the battle is nearing its end, said Yona. Both Qui-Gon and Kenobi were surprised that she knew their name when they didn't introduce themselves yet, and it seems like she knew more about them than they did about her. A. 